Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of the Vehicle Architecture series. Uh, last time, uh, like you know if you've tuned in, uh, we discussed how this impacts application views and uh, regional preferences as well, although there weren't a lot of regional nuances. Uh, I'm again joined uh, by my good friend Raul. Thanks Raul for joining us uh, yet again. Uh, as we are not uh, the drivers and impacts of uh, these changes in vehicle architecture uh, in this episode. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, so great. So Raul, uh, while we talked extensively about commercial and passenger vehicle side, the impacts on them and uh, uh, what the expectations of say drivers are. And in this one, I'd, I'd like to speak more specifically or at least about some of the angles that we could connect to the architecture space from say a economics or sustainability standpoint or maybe in yeah. even an environmental standpoint or even if there is some sort of regulation that's playing in that's driving this or mandating certain aspects uh maybe we could talk a little more about that so is there something we can add or at least delve deeper uh, from these angles uh, in your opinion yeah, there's uh, there are some indirect or or weaker forces involved here on the economic side, just because as you move to uh, higher voltage independent or sorry zonal modular architecture, you can reduce your variable cost of the vehicle because you need less copper, less uh, bigger processing units, etc. So there is that. Um, that also means that automakers or suppliers are less dependent on mining because then they can look at sustainable sources like recycling to meet their needs. So there is there is all that. And then in terms of regulation, again, it's there is a little bit, for instance, the IRA requiring you to have a certain amount of recycled material in the battery and in the vehicle. Uh, so that kind of drives it, but really, ultimately, we're talking about something that's driven by automakers, and it's basically to for them to manage the complexity. Right, right, and sort of conclude that these are still weaker forces that, um, since yeah. this transition is not, uh, I'd say, in full swing, right? So we do yeah. see that. So in terms of, like, see, if we talk about these aspects that we discussed or these angles, uh, that you just talked about right now when we talk about say specific benefits that is sort of because of what we talked a lot about the automakers OEM tier suppliers in this ecosystem right but one of the critical pieces which at least I feel that since the sort of the drivers consumers the end driver end consumers uh, who are paying for this at the end of the day right so if we pivot to talking about like how does this benefit someone who's sort of far out in this chain um, or how are they connected to this and what sort of sort of from a benefit standpoint if we can talk about that uh, i think what what's more tangible um it could be beneficial as well sure and and so the obvious uh benefit is that if you're lowering your cost then potentially you can have better pricing for customers right for consumers drivers obviously the automakers are for-profit companies so it's not a given it's not i reduce my costs therefore my customers enjoy that it, it could just simply go to profit but there is the potential of that um i think the 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 bigger benefit is really around efficiency um especially when you're talking about electrical vehicles because you're able to spend less energy in managing uh, the vehicle because you're not sending data all the way to the central hub, et cetera. But so there's benefits of just the vehicle being more efficient. And I don't want to say more importantly, but but as a driver, you'll notice more that the experience is a lot better because the the automakers by managing the complexity um, when you have an issue with some software some somewhere which we you know all cars will have that eventually the automaker is going to be able to fix it quicker uh than than before so 
that's in itself is going to be uh, a benefit. Um, and, and if you think about it, like, you know, you're, uh, when everything was centrally located, you do an update on your, for instance, lane departure, and then that screws up something with your, with your headlights or something, uh, 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 something else. Now, because everything is modular, et cetera, you're going to be able to send a fix for those glitches and, and it's only going to affect the lane departure. So you won't see the negative effect as a driver in the other systems that your car has. So again, experience is probably going to be the, the biggest uh, benefit here. And absolutely. I, I think you delineated towards uh, the cost savings side of it. But uh, from what I understood is that uh, the sort of the end experience is what matters the most, the consumer experience, if I may call that. And mm -hmm. if you if we were to talk a little more about this, because uh, there are actually types of drivers, if I may say, right? So it's like passenger car drivers like you and me. There's drivers who are driving, say, trucks, buses, basically on the commercial side, right? Now, if we were to talk about experience from that standpoint, do you, do you really see that this impact has differences when it when you talk about, say, passenger versus commercial mm -hmm. vehicle drivers? Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's a very interesting question because, yes, yeah, you know, it, we do transport a lot on uh, commercial vehicles. But so, first of all, remember that in a commercial vehicle, you're you're trying to generate profit for the owner or or the owner operator, et cetera. So the vehicle has to generate uh, profit. So in that context, by having this this modular uh, zonal architecture, and we already talked about the user experience, less glitches, or or being able to fix the glitches sooner, it is going to be a benefit because on one hand the owner can attract better drivers because of the promise of like, hey, you'll have a better experience driving this whatever vehicle it is because you're just going to push a button and the thing is going to do something and then you don't have to like fight, if you will, with all the software. Uh, it, it, it's also going to benefit um, just this, um, this problem that we have that there's just not enough skilled workers. So having a vehicle that is... It's just uh, easier to to drive to operate again. It's going to have a huge impact on. Okay, now you don't need such experienced drivers on your fleet uh, because the vehicle is going to be able to do a lot more things. Sure, no, and and definitely makes sense. We we absolutely seeing all these different key features that are being put in, right? So right from like say. Lane keep assist or driver assist, lane departure, all those that we talked about, right? But when we talk about this being a part of the experience, I'm sure there's a lot of um, aspects of, say, safety and performance that also weigh in, which is also equally important from an experience standpoint. So when we zero down on, say, specifically performance and safety, do you, do you feel that that's being considered? or at least being talked about from an impact standpoint, how is this talked about from a consumer experience standpoint uh, in, 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 in this whole sort of journey of the architecture transition? Yeah, so I, I would argue that it's almost impossible not to think about safety uh, or yeah. for automakers, for uh, suppliers, not to think about safety for the driver and the people around and, and, and plus there's also a ton of regulation. And so, um, you know, you, and you have to kind of separate the safety versus performance. We kind of talked a little bit about this, but when when everything is modular and and then it's a software uh, driven vehicle, et cetera, you do have a lot of, it's relatively easy to customize the performance of the vehicle uh, to basically your liking. Right because it's all enabled by software, et cetera, the hardware is already there. So um, in a way, uh, it's it's the same with on the safety side because you're able to, ins for instance, to uh, manage lane departure separately from 
let's say your augmented reality windshield to you know some other features you're really making the vehicle uh safer because again you you can turn on and off different things and not affect other things that are running and you can always update so so i would say it's um uh it's just a lot safer and 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 more convenient because again from the driver you're gonna have better control of how the vehicle keeps you safe sure sure and while we discussed quite a bit about a lot of these features and consumer experience being prime right in terms of its applicability and its uh, benefit over here being derived I think we'd be pivoting to another sort of sub topic, which gets, uh, which is very important to talk about as well as which is this transition to software defined vehicles with all of these key features, right? And with all of these features, electronics on board, I'm sure, and you've seen that as well. And we've, we've seen, we've seen that quite a bit into that realm of seeing, or at least the car witnessing higher loads. And I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure with these higher loads, we're talking about high voltages, the type of batteries that should be used now while everyone is uh, commensurate with like, hey, okay, there's a 12 volt battery in a car, there's two 12 volts batteries in a truck. But is there something being talked about from a mandate standpoint of how, what type of mm -hmm. voltage levels, or where is the shifting? Uh, is this being used as an alibi? To, to move towards certain aspects, what's the advantages, what's the disadvantages? Maybe maybe yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing to sort of think or ponder upon as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, so first of all, no, there's, there's really no mandate that says, okay, you have to move everything to high voltage, um, but uh, moving everything in, 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 to high voltage overall does reduce uh, a lot of the material that you need um i'm gonna exaggerate a little bit but uh but think about mm -hmm. when you are trying to run everything on t uh 12 volt voltage you're basically everything else that you're trying to do like fast charging uh, or charging and discharging all these things that are typically done at that we would prefer to do at higher rates cannot be done because you're doing it at 12 volts so mm -hmm. But on the opposite side, if you say, well, now everything is high voltage, you're able to not only like get the cost savings that we've talked about, but basically everything can run uh, at higher voltages. So you don't have to do a conversion of like, oh, I'm charging at high voltage, but I'm going to discharge at, at low voltage or vice versa. You really are in a way making the vehicle less complicated obviously we're primarily talking about electrical vehicles for plug-in hybrids at this point sure understood and so okay so it means no no mandate but definitely if it makes sense from a design or architecture standpoint it, it goes in but uh, i'd say very interesting few topics that we've talked about it's it's perfect to have you again i'm intrigued by the far-reaching knowledge and I, I i would i'm sure even the viewers would take take a lot of out of this. So thanks again, Raul, for joining me and uh, to the view viewers as well. Thank you. Uh, in our next thank episode, uh, we will discuss what it means uh, regarding the outlook and strategic uh, considerations uh, for OEMs and some tier suppliers that they should take. So thank you so much for joining.